This is Mfundishi Jehuti Maska in Haru, Hassan Kamal Salim, taking you on a spiritual journey to the Black International African Cultural Art Museum. And so we're going to start out in the foyer here, and we're going to start out with the 42 laws of Ma'at. And so these are the ideals of Ma'at. So I have a divine sister here, Sister Zelma, and we're explaining to her these 42 laws of Ma'at. As you can see, I honor virtue, I benefit with gratitude, I am peaceful, I am respectful, I am a proprietor of others. The idea here is that this is how we want to live our life. And so this is it, this is your, your guide. Again, we want you to get belly. Look up to the ceiling. We, we wanted you to feel that you were really involved in a committed temple. Uh, so the baguette, the victorious Haru over the doorway, just like in the temples of ancient Kemet, from the uh, second golden age on, on all the temples you would have to baguette. It means that Haru was victorious of the Phoenix set. And so here we have a stella, a spirit door, where the ancestors could come in and talk to us. They're just saying, that's Ma'at Kara. You can see the name of the king here, Ma'at Kara. And so it, it means that truth, justice, he holds the spirit of truth and justice for Ra, for the light of the universe. Mm -hmm. And he is Men Kepara. So it's showing you his name. So each king has two names inside of a ship. Mm. Every king has five names, but two are inside of a ship. Okay. And you can see right here, he is saying, uh, for example, he is uh, the, be the beautiful nature. The beautiful nature is in the heavens. So that's what that just says there. The beautiful nature is in the heavens. And I was explaining to a student earlier this morning, that heaven is not like the mythological heaven you see in the Bible and all that. Heaven is being one with the creator. Pure spirit. It's not a place. It is the totality of oneness. Mm -hmm. That you return to that source. Mm -hmm. The source of, of the creator. Mm -hmm. Now we do have a, a lift here. If somebody was handicapped and mm -hmm. they want a wheelchair, mm -hmm. this will lift them up to the next floor. Wow. Mm -hmm. by how they treat their women. Okay, so it's really important the personification of black women. If you look back behind you, you'll see Imhotep. He is the builder of the step pyramids. And so you see the step pyramids, so you see Imhotep. And then here you can look Imhotep, also mastery of uh, temples. So you can see uh, what a sacred temple would look like with the columns. And Impu, the guardian, and Basset music and dance. Mm -hmm. So the pictures you see on the wall here are, are actually pictures that actually come from the temples of Ichi mm -hmm. So this wasn't like an artistic rendering. Mm -hmm. This is actually a, we made, we took a picture, mm -hmm. blew it up into a wall tapestry. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and this was like for, for the chair, back of the chair, Tut Ankh Amin's tomb. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, a ruling chair. So this is his golden, his golden hand. His golden hand. So that's tough. Oh, and this is the Ma'at mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Again, this is a continuation of the personification of black women. Uh -huh. So she's just symbolic of a hemet and the suit we're at. Uh -huh. So we didn't have a concept called queen. Uh -huh. That's a European concept, right? Uh -huh. Which is the whore of the king. Ooh. That's what that really means, okay? <laughs> but we call it hemet and the suit we're at, the great royal wife. And sometimes she's called God's wife, or the mother of the gods of the natural world. So that's what that's depicted. And when you make something black, that's the highest deification you can do. Okay, so black might not have been the exact color of her skin, but they're trying to deify her. So when they make you black like that, that, that was, you see, when you see pictures of Nefertari and all of this, she's depicted black. They're showing you that's the highest exaltation you can do.
This is the common people. You see Afro, these are all black people. So this is the common workers who were skilled. These were the skilled laborers. You see on this wall. And then look behind you on this wall is the common laborers. These are the people who were the farmers, which was the largest uh, business in ancient Kemet. More people were, and it was an agricultural country. Okay, so farming was their number one produce, their fruits, their grains. Here you see cattle herders. But again, I wanted you to see the common people, yes. how they were living. And you notice there's no Wazungu in here. All you see is all black people. This is. Mm. And now we come into the, uh, the temple. Okay, as you come in, you just kind of enter the sacred temple. This is actually writings from the Per Emperor. So this is the Book of Coming for, uh, uh, excuse me, the pyramid text, what they call the pyramid text, the pyramid text. If you see the writing is, is everywhere here. And so this first wall here is dedicated to um, Nefertari. Nefertari was the third golden age, 18th dynasty. Uh, she was the Hemet and the Sukhwaret of Ursa Ma'at Ra Setepen Ra, who they call Ramses II. So this is her. And she even depicted herself just like the kings did. So that's her and the lioness, as a lioness, right? That's the Haru and Maketi up top with the double fingers. And all along, you're going to see culture artifacts of Western Africa. We want to show you that Kemet was the mouthpiece of the whole African continent. It wasn't just that little Nile Valley. That what they were doing in West Africa and South Africa is a rendition of what was being done in Kevin. Mm -hmm. So in those universities were people from all throughout Africa and the world coming there to teach their science. Mm -hmm. So Kevin is the mouthpiece. It would be like somebody just getting a close up of your lips and we need the rest of your body out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the lips is a package deal. So Kevin was a package deal of the rest of the body. Uh, let me take you in this room over here. This room is dedicated to Akhenaten. I can't attend. So Akhenaten, again, is a king of the 18th dynasty. Here he is with his queen, Nefertiti. So you hear a whole lot of hype, Nefertiti. Mm -hmm. One who is twice beautiful, so he, she is the uh, wife of Akin Aten. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here he is. They had six daughters, mm -hmm. and this is them. But what I love here is this is his father, who is the king, and then here is his grandfather, mm -hmm. all kings of ancient Kemet. So this is the so-called 18th dynasty. So you see here, and here's a close-up of Akhenaten of what he looked like. You probably know some brothers in the hood that look like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, he looked like Barack Obama a little bit. <laughs> uh, and behind you, this room is also dedicated to this brother name is uh, Jules Taylor. Jules Taylor was the uh, uh, curator of the Brooklyn Museum, who was a black Egyptologist who was fighting in the 1960s and 70s that the ancient Egyptians were black when they were trying to, you know, had uh, Elizabeth yeah. Taylor and they had Richard Burton and all of them playing uh, black actors mm -hmm. and he was fighting that that was a false depiction and this was his PhD on defending that Africans, the Asian Egyptians were black mm -hmm. and this is what he looked like but he's, he died early, he's, he died like in his uh, late 40s mm -hmm. uh, but, so we put a dedication to him, he inspired the people who actually helped set up my partners that actually set up this room he was like their teacher. In fact, these three um, large pictures were part of the Brooklyn Museum exhibit. Mm -hmm. And they were going to throw it in the garbage afterwards. And he said, oh, no, no, no. I got some people who can use this. And because of him, we had those. My goodness. Hmm. So again, from ceiling to floor, we tried to embellish this place. Ladies, as you come out, you're looking at Menchu Hotel. So if you're familiar with any of my work, you know that uh, I'm one of the authorities on Menchu Hotel. I've written two books, and I'm doing the third book on Menchu Hotel. It's called Menchu Hotel in the Spirit of the Magi. 
And this is what Mitchell Hotep depicted himself looking like. So if he looked like Charles Van Hessen, I think he would have made himself looking like that. Mm -hmm. He looked like this. <laughs> and you almost know nothing about him. He is the founder of the second golden age, the classical period of ancient Kemet. Classical means the best that you have to offer. And so here's the person who's the founder of the classical age, and nobody knows who he is. He's not in no high school books, no textbooks, not even in college books. And if you look him up on the Wikipedia, they got one little paragraph on him. And he is the king that united Upper and Lower Kemet and founded the Second Golden Age. This is another picture of him, how he depicted himself. Menchu Hotep, his name means the nature of war is at peace. Menchu Hotep. This is a military during his time. So these are the these are the Magi warriors from Kush, the Nubian warriors, and these are the Egyptian warriors. The Egyptian warriors have just the white linen. The Kushite warriors got the colorful ones. You know, further south you went, the more colorful ones. <laughs> but the masters of the bow, masters of the shield. Right? So this is what his army looked like during his reign. Everybody got an afro, everybody's black. I mean, I'm sure if there was one little pink guy in there, they would have put him. <laughs> so this went inside of the tomb of the high priest and the king. So that means you were trying to depict the best. It wasn't like you just did some any, any old stuff. This represents Simitawi, the unification of Upper and Lower Kemet. So Menchu Hotep issued in the second golden age. So you see... Uh, Hopi of the north and Hopi of the south. Hopi is the name of the Nile River. So you have the upper Nile versus the lower Nile, and you see a knot tied in the center of the papyrus and the lotus plant. So the two plants were the papyrus and the lotus, and they're tied in the knot. And this meant Simatawi, the unity of the two lands. Now get a good look of what the Africans did pick, how they picked themselves. This is the actual color, just the way it was uh, duplicated, just the way it was in the tomb. So these are Nubians coming to pay homage and those are not donuts. Those are gold bars, gold circles. You know, somebody said, oh, they had a Dunkin' Donuts back there. No. Uh, <laughs> and this is frankincense and myrrh and other herbs that they were coming to trade. So these are wealthy people. These are not some beggars from the south coming to Egypt. Begging. They're coming here. This is commerce. This is economic trade. They're coming with goods, cattle, leopard skins, gold, precious, you know, semi precious stones, minerals. And you can see the feather in the head here, showing that these are the Nubians. And all the way, that feather is worn in the head just like that, all the way to Zulu and South Africa. So uh, you see tribes, that, uh, my homeland is in Tanzania, you'll see people with the same thing when you look out with the Maasai and other people like that. Uh, the Samburu, they wear some of the same type of dress and everything still in Africa today. Traditional Africa, not modern. And again, just pay attention, just look at the, these are West African artifacts, again, showing our expertise. We've always been a dynamic people. When people leave us alone to express our art and our culture, This is the famous Benin culture that you see uh, in Western Africa. This is the Oba, the king or riding on his horse. His horse has armor and everything. Everybody's decorated. <laughs> and here on this wall, again, you see Aset. So it says words spoken by Aset. So it has Aset, and she has the crown like a pet haru. But this is why it's so important to read the glyphs. Because when somebody look at this, they automatically think that's pet haru, hathor. But it says, words spoken by Aset. She wears the, the same crown because all the women were great women and shared their crowns. So Mut, the mother of Amen, has the headdress, the vulture, pet haru, the great cow, the horns, like that. And then Aset would uh, wear the, the throne. So you see the throne right here. Mm -hmm. 
So she had to. So all those women shared crowns because they all represent the great women. It was more symbolic than as opposed to a real person there. And this is Mut Nefertari. Mut Nefertari. And her name, Mut Nefertari. And she is beloved of Mut. And this is her wearing her things. And like I said, she is the wife of Ursa Ma'at Ra Setepa Ra, who they call Ramses II. In fact, this temple here, next to this temple, was dedicated to her. It was the first gigantic temple dedicated to a woman. And so this is two sides. This is on one, and to the right of this would have been her temple. When you look through, there was three chambers here. And you look right through the Holy of Holies. Doing two times a year, the sun comes through. It hits the four statues right on their forehead. Boom, 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 boom. Perfect. That means that you need to know astronomy, astrology, mathematics, geometry, all of that at the highest level. UNESCO, when they built the high dam in 1960, moved this temple. So they tried to duplicate the same thing, and they could not. Now, two times a year, when the sun comes through, it hits one of the statues on the knee, <laughs> on the kneecap, it, the toes of another one, and it misses the last two all together. So the guy said, oh, that's the nest of darkness. No. <laughs> you know, so they're trying to lie to cover up that they can't do what was done 4,000 years ago. And this is approximately 2000 BCE. So add 2000 onto that, so you're talking about approximately 4,000 years ago. That's the level of engineering and expertise that was in ancient Egypt among black people. This is before Greeks, before the Romans, before the Persian Empire, before the Assyrian Empire. We were doing this. If you look down at your feet, you see the Ujat, the all saying, I right, looking at you. So we tried it from ceiling to floor again. Tried it to pick that. And here, you again, you see some uh, artifacts again from West Africa. So we're trying to show you the kingship from Yorba and Benin. And this is looking inside of the, the holy temple here. So we couldn't build columns here. So we put the picture here of the columns. So when we do presentations or programs, this would be the front right there where the Holy of Holies is. And the audience would be sitting there. This is a real leopard skin. Now, I know you think that the lion is the king of the jungle. That's because you got your information from the wazoo, from your hands. The leopard is the king. The lion is one of the most powerful, respected cats. The lion is not even in the jungle. The lion is a savanna creature. The leopard is in the jungle. Okay? So the high priest wears the leopard skin. Not the lion, okay? So I'm just trying to let you know. All Africans know that, but because somebody else is telling our story, we're running around with false information. The lion is not even in the jungle. The real king of the jungle would be the gorilla, silverback gorilla. There's nothing more powerful than him. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyhow, this is the real leopard skin that the high priest wears. And last but not least, over here, this is an exact replica of Tut Ankh-Amun's ruling chair at the 18th dynasty. So here's Tep Ankh Amun. Here's his wife, Ankh Ness. And the Aten, rays of, of the rod coming down on him. So this would have been real gold instead of some gold paint. <laughs> that would have been real lapis lazuli stone, real um, um, red jasper for the body, and all of that. So the colors and everything is duplicated exactly the same. And over here, I just wanted you to see, see the lion is respected. Here's the lion right here on both sides, if, if you see his throne. You see the lion on both sides. So we understood it was one of the most powerful of all the cats of new respect, but the king wears the, they wear the leopard skin, the high priest. And even in North America here, among the Mayans and the Incans, the high priest wears a jaguar skin. Mm -hmm. The jaguar looks like the leopard. You think that's a coincidence? No, the same people came here, but there was no leopard, so they used the jaguar. But the same type of thing. And we had a mountain lion here in North America, but they used the jaguar because it looks like the leopard skin. So I'm trying to show you. It's the same people perfected their art and then took the show on the road. His crown, that's called the Caprush crown, the blue crown. If you see the little circles on it, that's not what, that represents knots, nappy hair curls of the hair. 
The word nappy is the word for hair in Medunetia. Nappy. That's hair. So we held that word over and not knowing it. Oh, your hair's nappy. It means your hair's curly. Spiral of the universe. A number nine. Spiral of the universe. <laughs> so that was the, the crown of war. They were, the crown was imitating the hairstyle of the Kushites, the Nubians, who helped liberate Asian Kemet from the foreigners. So in the third golden age, they made the war crown to imitate the hairstyle of these Africans from the south. So at this point, I'd like to entertain any questions. Did you have? So you can see we're still uh, bringing in, uh, our, we have a whole basement full of artwork from almost all the countries in Africa. So we changed the themes and stuff like that. But right now we wanted to show West Africa similar to East Africa. So that was the idea. I like to know about her because to me, it's like I came and see a reincarnation of me <laughs> from the colors of the clothes and everything. So I'm like, did you call me here? You almost wear the same colors. Yes. Yeah, that's so it. A little history on Tur Turquoise was the most used stone in color on the planet Earth of natural stones because it represented communication and ancestral connection. So whether you were in Australia, whether you were in Egypt, whether you were Native American, turquoise, this stone right here. I have, in fact, I got two turquoise here. I have an American turquoise and then I have an African turquoise. Don't wear it because it's connection to the ancestors and communication. And we know crystallology from ancient Kemet. You see the jewelry, like a Tetlock armor, you see the stuff here. Mm -hmm. So we were the first jewelers of the planet. Mm -hmm. Other people saw the stones, but they didn't know what to do with them. They had no idea. We understood that it represented energy. Mm -hmm. And gold was the skin of the Dutch room, because it doesn't tarnish. Mm -hmm. So we were the first to do the smelting of the, of the melting in any large number. In fact, right now I read an article maybe a month or so ago that some people are saying that aliens must have made the jewelry of Tetlock Amun because Africans didn't have the skills at that time. Mm -hmm. and Which is crazy. And the aliens put his name on the back and everything, you know, I guess. That's crazy. I mean, you know, I'm just showing you the extent they're going to try to show this is our culture and history. That's why this is a cultural museum, mm -hmm. not just a history museum. Mm -hmm. Because culture is your medicine. If you show me a people who don't have their culture, I'll show you totally enslaved people. I'll show you people who are puppets of somebody else and trying to look like somebody that they're not. That sound familiar to us? What's going on here? Yeah. Because we don't know our culture. It was taken from us. And even those of us who were indigenous to this continent, that indigenous culture was taken from us. And the ones who were brought here, that culture was taken from. And then they pushed y'all all together and told you all y'all were Negroes. And, uh, and, and then nobody knows who they are anymore. In fact, there's a writing of George Washington. I'm going to post that up on my Facebook. George Washington is talking to Congress, and he's talking about the Moors who are here, who they're signing the con treaty with. He said, if we control their education, if we disconnect them from their ancient ancestors, they won't know who they are just two generations from now. And then we can enslave them just like we do everybody else. That's the words of George Washington, your first president. I mean, so they knew that whole Willie Lynch thing, they had that, they, they knew that formula, that they were going to use that to mess our minds up. And here it is over 300 years later, and we're still arguing what to call us. You know, we Negroes, we Afro-Americans, we colored, we... we <laughs> Not even it depends really. on what group you're in. We are more. Some people don't want to be, can't use black. I mean, here we still are. We're Christians. We're Muslims. We're, we can't do with none of that. I have a question, please. Um, in which dynasty was um, where kings or tribes allowed to, you know, basically come into their kingship using these kind of attires? What, what the question was? In which dynasty... Oh. Could they be seen coming into that royalty, coming into that knowingness, you know, of who we oh, are okay. as a people? Oh, let me say this. Even before the so-called first dynasty, they had already developed it. Mm -hmm. So let me say something. Dynasties were created by the Greeks. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
We didn't have no dynasties. We, you know, there's 32 dynasties, mm -hmm. counting the Romans. No, Manatho was the high priest during the time of the Ptolemies. Mm -hmm. The Ptolemies were Greek Macedonian rulers of Egypt under, after Alexander conquered Egypt. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know the history of the people they were ruling. Mm -hmm. So they closed all the temples and brought everything to Alexandria, the great temple of Alexandria, right? And so the high priest of Amun could speak Greek and the Madunetra. Mm -hmm. So he translated all the stuff and broke down the, the, the rulers into family groups. Mm -hmm. And a family group was called a dynasty. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a decade, which is 10 or uh, you know, century, 100, or millennium, 1,000. No, a, a, a dynasty could be 25 years, 33 years, 102 years. It's the ruling of a family or the same ideology. So let's say I died and I had no heirs and you became the next ruler. Now we're not bloodly related, but you want to keep the same philosophy that I've been doing. So you would still be in my same dynasty. So like Tuck Amun, when he died, there was no heir to the throne. He had no children. So I, but the high priest, became the next ruler. He tried to marry one of Akhenaten's other daughters. And then, but he was already in his late 60s when he came on the throne. So he only ruled for four, five, six, seven years. So then who's going to rule? He ain't had no kids. He was already 70 years old. He didn't have no kids, okay? So he did have a son who should have probably been the next king. But mysteriously, he vanished. And the head of the military, who was Haru Imhab, they call Haran Hab, became the last king of the 18th dynasty. He's not related to nobody. So we don't know if there was some hanky-panky there, you know, because uh, I know some, some people had a chariot accent. That sounded like a mafia hit. You know? <laughs> so all that type of happened in the record. So, but he kept, he wanted to return Egypt to the worship of Amin-Ra. Amin. So he was a champion of that. So it's the same philosophy, so he's still in that same dynasty. And then Seti took over and said, okay, that's enough of that. We're gonna bring this back to the royal family. And Seti, and that's where you have um, uh, all the um, Ramesses kings, you know. So Seti is the father of Ramesses I and stuff like that, okay. So then you have, and they got all the way up to Ramses the 13th, who were like in the 19th dynasty and 20th dynasty. But they're not related to each other. They just took on that same name. So they were not related, how were they appointed? Uh, uh, sometime uh, uh, the high priest, I mean, uh, uh, excuse me, the king could appoint his successor. Oh. Just like today, if you're just, you know, you can appoint the successor to your estate. Mm -hmm. So sometime, you know, uh, if it wasn't blood related, uh, you can appoint your next successor. Uh, there wasn't a lot of coups or anything like that. Because, see, the king is the high priest. So you just can't kill somebody and say, I'm the king now, and you don't know nothing about the culture or anything of that nature. So the king is the high priest. And then he appoints the high priest to each of the temples in Kemet to represent him. It's like today, when the president is elected, what's the first thing he has to do? He has to elect his cabinet. That's imitation of ancient Kemet. So the high priest, so you want to put your people in there. So if you were the head of agriculture and I'm the new, and I don't like you, I come in, you're not the head of agriculture no more. You just get, you know, your job is over. I'm going to appoint my people in there now. So that's what each president does. That's what was in ancient Kemet. Each uh, high priest then appointed the high priest who was going to be loyal to him for each of the temples in ancient Kemet. This is dedicated to the, the afterlife. So if you can see all the scenes here are dealing with the duet. The duet is the world in between. This is after your physical life is gone. This is the world of the duet. So you can see the preparation, the sahu. Preparation, what they call the mummy, but that's the sahu. So he's preparing the body. You can see here people giving praise and, and, and uh, to their beloved uh, uh, either ancestor now. And you can see Asar over, you can see him being bandaged, and then the, the musicians. And so we know how to do a funeral from ancient Kemet. showed us just how, you know, how it should be done. Um, and what's, what was the symbolism of the cow? Hmm? The cow was... Yeah, that's just trying to show the traditional uh, people mm -hmm. 
and with the, the to that. yeah in the background. This is a uh, a, a sahu. So this is the same thing that you have here. So this actually belongs to one of my partners. When he dies, he's going to be inside here. So he. So did, did he bring it back from Egypt like that? Like in one yeah, he bought it just like that. Oh, wow. Isn't the sahu Orion the constellation? Yes, yeah, sahu is Orion too, but it's also the name of preparing the body for eternity. So here you see Enpu, who is the nature of uh, mummification, Sahu. And here he is giving life, and that's afterlife now. Life is eternal. I was explaining earlier to one of my students that we are electromagnetic beings. The electric from the sun, magnetic from the earth. So you have an electromagnetic force field around you. Your body is just a container for your electromagnetic force. You are your spirit, it's your soul, rather. Right? And your soul is part of the spirit, which is part of the one. So when you leave this body, you go back to the one. So you energy cannot be destroyed, only transformed from one state to another. So here we're showing that transformation. So here's the judgment scene over here. Pu taking Anui by the hand. This is all in the spirit world. So this is the soul now. This is not human beings now. This is the soul. And the judges are in the top, so our courtroom, our court system, everything is imitating what we saw in ancient Kevin. The Greeks and the Romans just took everything that we had. They have almost nothing original. The Senate, all of that's imitation. In the Senate, you wore a togo. That means that you were educated in Kevin. You know, so it's just trying to show you that, you know, but that's not taught in the school. We think everything starts from the Greek and the Romans, not knowing that they sat at our feet. And you know what? And they didn't really try to hide it. They actually said it. It's later after the Romans and the, and the new Europeans are the ones that tried to falsify claims. Uh, the Greeks tell you, we got this from here. Uh, now the Romans, things got a little funky with them because they closed on everything. They made it against the law to speak with your nature and all of that. Can you say again what was the sound again? Hmm? Aside from Orion, you said in the afterlife. Sahu. Preparing the body for eternity. So, so that's what rap is. That's preparing. That's why and it took 70 days to prepare a song. Mm -hmm. So because you took all the organs out. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, you, and you cleanse them yeah. and purify mm -hmm. them the and wrap them also. Now, I love this. Guess what? Here's a question that's probably going through your head. Why do you want to wrap the organs and all of that? Why don't we take them out? The judgment scene. Now, usually, this is only known by the priests. Usually, common people don't have this knowledge. After you go through the first, the judges ask you, "Have you stolen? Have you killed anyone?" And you say, "No, I have not. I have not. I have not." Then they take your heart symbolically and they weigh it with a feather of truth, and it balances out, meaning that you've been a righteous person. It means it doesn't mean you've never done anything bad. It means that whatever you have done that wasn't my eye, you offset it with something that was my eye. So now, Jehuti is the master of the Akashic Records. So he's written down everything you have done. So you can't lie. He got it. Jehuti is right there with all the records. So he was like, well, how about your grandmother's cookies when you were in the fifth grade? <laughs> and you said, oh, okay. All right. All right. Nobody's supposed to know that. You know? <laughs> but then you said, wait a minute. But when my grandmother was old and had no teeth, I chewed her food for her. So Jehuti says, oh. Okay. 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 Right. So now, after you've passed that, now they left out somebody. Shishat should, should be there also. Shishat should be behind Jehuti because she's a librarian. She puts all of that in perspective and makes sure it's recorded. Jehuti writes it and tells it, but she files it. Now Haru leads you to his father who art in heaven. How be thy name, thy kingdom done. Come. Yeah, yeah. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> All stolen straight from here. And that's why in the Christian world it says the only way to the Father is through the Son. Haru is the son of Asar. And so if you look around the bin here, you stand up, you see Asar. So there he is on his throne. So that's the final judgment. Now there, there's another scene here. Before you actually went in here, you would see 
the deceased person hair turned white because now he's looked upon the nature, the face of Cecil B. DeMille's did that with Moses when he saw the burning bush when he came back down his hair was white imitating exactly what they saw here so here's a sorry so now let me go back to my question about Sahu and all the organs so now Asar wants to see, he wants to see your liver. He wants to see your lungs. So if your lungs is all shriveled up and dried up, no, you weren't living this righteous life that you claim to be. You were eating the wrong food. You, you, your colon's all backed up. Yeah, That's so why we do when we go to the water. Yeah. During the ancestor day, and we give homage as for all those souls who didn't get yeah. a proper bear, who got eaten by sharks and right. just thrown into the water and stuff like that. In fact, they used to say there used to be a line of sharks that used to travel the slave ships oh, all the wow. way to the coast because they knew bodies were going to be coming overboard. Oh, wow. So in your mind, based on kinetic, um, I don't know, spirituality. spirituality, how do you see that? The fact that a lot of our ancestors were not properly buried, how do you see the impact on successive or subsequent um, reincarnations or generations? And how is it impacting us right now in the diaspora? Well, it's, it's a double fold. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number one is that remember, spirit cannot be destroyed. Mm -hmm. So their spirits, their souls, and spirit is still here. Right, right. But it's a troubled spirit. Right. So that's why we give tribute to the ancestors, mm -hmm. to try to appease these spirits that have never been given a proper sending off party, right, right. you know. Yeah. And that's why you have an a, a ancestor altar, and that's why your altar should be separated. You don't have the living entities with your ancestor entities on the same altar, mm -hmm. so that I can give a prominent hum proper homage mm -hmm. to those who died, who maybe, whether they got a proper percent off or not, mm -hmm. I try to put their souls at rest. Right. Now, it's believed that some of those souls that are in an incomplete state are still around here because they got a complete still submission to get to the next level. Mm -hmm. So that, like, we're talking right now on the third dimension. Fourth dimension is a higher consciousness. We're still here is that we're taking in information at a different level. Mm -hmm. Fifth dimension is still, you're still here in the physical world. You didn't go no place, you're still here physically, but your understanding of the world is different. You're not part of the matrix. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. so when you move into an ancestral realm, some people in the fifth dimension are able to commune with those to help them on their journey to become complete so that they can be at one. Mm -hmm. So because they were, a, you know, like some people are atrociously murdered or things of that nature. They still get a chance to appease through their ancestry, but you can't forget them. Mm -hmm. That's why I think it's state, once a person's name is no longer spoken and they're forgotten, that's when they're really dead. If nobody ever remembers you and there's no record of you and your name is never mentioned again, you are lost in the hills of Never Never Land. So that's why the ancestors would have a tomb with your name on it. Mm -hmm. And the Europeans just imitated that because they didn't have that. Mm -hmm. They didn't have ancient burial grounds like that. And the ancient Asians, uh, they cremated. You know, they just cremated the dead in the ashes. So is cremation um, a good thing to do or is it not? You know what, I, I leave it to people's personal choice. Personal. Yeah, because the body is just going back, ash to ash, dust to dust, you're going back to the ashes. So whether you get there through a natural decaying process mm -hmm. or whether you help it along with a little fire, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're gone. you know, yes, you're uh, it's still the spirit, yes. is, you know, like I know some people want to be cremated and have their ashes sprinkled in the ocean, mm -hmm. you know, or, or in the garden. Oh, oh, like that, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, some ancient Asians used to eat their ancestors. They used their ancestors' ashes as seasoning. You know, mm -hmm. tonight's dinner, we got a little grandpa's, little grandpa seasoning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> uh, but that, that wasn't that wasn't ongoing, right? That, hmm? was, that was shortly after they passed a way to connect with them? Not more than one time, right? No, just it would probably be, a, but remember, that's why urn was created. Our urn was to put the ashes in. Mm -hmm. 
so that you can maybe do ceremonies or do certain things or uh, have it you know, at certain times in the name of that person. But it was mostly just symbolic because those ashes don't represent that person anymore. Remember, that's just a container. Mm -hmm. But when they ate them, it was... Sim it was just symbolic. Oh, you eating the ashes of the ancestors. Mm -hmm. It was you know, a symbolic gesture. Well, you know people in the physical can talk to the ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. You were saying so in the fifth dimension you talked to the oh, ancestors? Oh, yeah, in the fifth dimensions, that, that some of the priests, like I'm a fifth dimensional priest. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. We can communicate mm -hmm. with those who souls are mm -hmm. still around. Right. who haven't went to rest yet because they haven't completed a mission yet. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, you know, they're here to help you so that they can continue on their mission. Mm -hmm. Only the Europeans created the haunted house and right, monsters right, right. from Ghosts. the land of the living dead. That's, that's, that doesn't exist in the African phenomenon mm -hmm. in almost any African culture. Mm -hmm. uh, the Europeans at first didn't even bury their dead. What animals do you know other animals buried the dead? I don't know. No, none. Okay, so if a bear dies in a cave, then he just gets, you know, he's in the cave, that's it. So if you live in a cave and Grandpa died, you know, we just push them over to the side. So now can you imagine Grandpa been dead three days and Gregor Boyd is sitting and he stands up, Ugh! Ah! everybody out of the cave. So that's... That's in their subconscious mind. So we didn't have horror. We created theater. Theater was in Kemet, right. but we didn't have horror. The Greeks had horror. The Greeks, they brought in horror as part of, we had comedy, joy, storytelling, folklore, but we didn't have horror. Their relationship and culture in the cave, in the mountains, yes. created horror. I know that this is probably from Western Africa. Yes, that's an Enikisi. What does it mean? What does it symbolize? It's a healer. Oh. Or an medicator. Every nail represents a case that a person has helped cure oh, or, or somebody you've helped venerate. Oh. So it is a mirror to reflect that you are a reflection of the law right in the center. Oh, I don't know what's protected. I have one at home that's four headed. Mama Jeffries told me it was worth over $100,000. Wow. But that's the key from the front. Yeah. Oh. So it was a like a porcupine. Hmm? I always thought it was protection like a porcupine. <laughs> the nails. Uh, it's, it's, uh, each person they healed, you said. Yeah. Wow. So Dr. Sishat was saying that you do a yearly um, tour to Egypt, is that mm -hmm. correct? Right. So do you do it at the same time every year, like in January, February? Yeah, no, we have, yeah. Or is it pretty uh, much? No, it, it kind of, sees we've kind of switched up each time. But we do it a couple, like I have a trip going in December. Uh -huh. It's like December 6th through the 21st, something like that. You come home just before Kwanzaa or the holiday. Right. So you can bring gifts or whatever, you know. Right, right. Uh, so that's December we have a trip going. And when and is then, your next one? And then, then we, the next one is February, Black History Month, oh, okay. February 16th. Okay. So we have two trips uh, scheduled right now for Egypt. Okay. And how do we find out about your your tours? On my website, website. And uh, one, I'm the I'm the I'm the tour guide for Hoppy Films mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for Hoppy. So they give the one in February. Yes. So I'm their tour guide. Okay. So you'll see if you go to HoppyFilm.com, right. you'll see that another one. If you go on my website, Infodisi Chihutimas, you'll see another one that I I also sponsor trips. So I do some things that Hoppy doesn't do. Right. You know, Hoppy usually does a, a pretty big trip. Like they might have, like we had uh, one of the trips we did last year had uh, eighty-five people mm -hmm. on it. You know, wow, that's uh, big. That's and we've had good. trips, you know, even bigger than that. So eighty-five. Mm -hmm. We rent out a whole cruise ship, mm -hmm. so you go on the cruise down the Nile. You don't have to be shared it with French, Germans, mm -hmm. like there's all black people. Is it easy to manage when you have such a large group like that? Is, mm -hmm. it, is it easy to manage? When yeah, you because have we have, uh, like you know, uh, it's yeah. segments, you know, we, you yeah. know, assign, we have two or three buses. Oh. I know the last trip, people were mad because we had three buses. Mm -hmm. So I'm t the way I'm teaching y'all, I'm on the bus and I'm still teaching like this. So the other people didn't get this. They were like, that ain't fair. Y'all got it from Ishi, you know. <laughs> You gotta share him, you know. I mean, they're like, no, he's on bus one, 
Oh, Y'all just gotta live through it, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, this is, this wow. Yeah. No, but this technology is that it should videotape you. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, but uh, mm -hmm. so what we do when I the trip I give in December is more intimate. Like last time we had twelve people, we had a dozen people. Mm -hmm. So it's real intimate. So we're always together. We're always in the group. And what I usually do sometimes at the end of the evening, I'll hold a special little workshop to review all the things we did today. Because mm -hmm. if you go to the Temple of Amen mm -hmm. at Waset, it's huge. It's a mile and a half long and a mile wide. You go through, you can't digest all of that. Right? So we take you, this is Ramsey's, this is so and so, this is so. But you're just like taking pictures, but you can't digest all that. So then that evening, those people, and we don't make it mandatory, it's just those people who want to. You meet me in the lounge, and then I'll go over all the things that we went over today. So, it can, you know, you can either take notes or record it. So today you might have just been taking pictures and running around, you know, uh, mesmerized. Because, you know, when you see the pyramid, all that stuff that you read goes out of your mind, and you're in shock. You're like, huh. <laughs> you know, as you look up, you know. Right? Like, so all the stuff you read just, just went out of your head, you know. You just, you just want to go over and touch it and kiss it. And you forget about how it was built and all of that. You forget, you know, you forget all that. So, sometimes you need to reflect afterwards. You go back and reflect. So that's what we do. So again, we have a trip in December and a trip in February. So you're you're um, you're not here kind of semi regular hours. It's important. To, yeah, to I'm tell. only here Sunday and Monday. Mm -hmm. Sunday and Monday. But, but always in, after like two, maybe. No, no, it's by appointment. Oh, it is, really? Yeah, so you can come in the morning, it can come in the afternoon. Oh, okay. It's, it's by appointment.